My name is Bob Savitz. I'm one of the current chair of the session. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the same thing I'm going to say. And uh, he will be my, my current chair, Federico, from Costa Rica. Say hello, Federico. Laurie, it's hard for us to hear your voice clearly, at least for me. There's multiple echoes. Ditto for me here, yes. Still having trouble, Laura. Still having trouble. Um, there's a kind of a muffled echo, and your voice is indistinct. Just one more minute to those on the room because I need to. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, while we like this for those of us in the room, um, could you, you know, uh, I need to take down for a little bit, could you put your hand up if you're a lawyer? If you're currently practicing as a lawyer, and so put your hand up if you're in law school. Very good, very good. Put your hand up if you are not in the legal sector at all. Amazing, that's progress. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you. Um, that's great. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Attempt number two. Uh, for our panelists online, does this sound um, better? Is is it clear? No. No. Okay. Okay. I don't know whether anyone has anything to try to talk. It's just. I'm just going to open my thought. Okay, trying again. Is the sound better? Online, can you hear me better? No. I can make out your words. It's not ideal sound. Okay. Um, we have Tejas helping us the technical side of things. Is it is that 
Now you sound like you're coming off the bullhorn in a ship. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it's this. Okay. How how does this sound, everyone? Sorry, everybody. Yeah, we, can, we Laura, can I make a suggestion? Speak very slowly. Okay. But go ahead if you need to. Is this better? Yeah, it'll do. Okay. I will take that. I'll settle for it will do. Okay, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Lara Duvatsidis. I am a project lawyer at the International Bar Association. I'm Australian qualified and started my career as an environment and planning solicitor at a commercial law firm in Australia. We are here today to talk about advancing climate competent lawyering across the board. We are going to hear from practitioners who have varying exp legal experiences uh, to help discuss some pertinent questions on this topic with a view to advancing our collective understanding on how lawyers can roll up their sleeves and get more involved. With us today, is our co-chair Federico Peralta Bedoya, who I will give this mic over to. What we're going to do is uh, Federico will quickly say hello. I will then briefly introduce our panel, both in the room and online, and we're then going to jump straight into our discussion questions. The style of this panel is uh, dynamic. We are going to be engaging with each other and we'll do our best to facilitate that, those that are at home and those that are in the room. So with that, Federico, would you like to say hello? Thank you, Lara. Greetings from Costa Rica. Okay, welcome everybody to the Glasgow room. And thank you everybody that is present and also online. My name is Federico Peralta Lodoya. I'm a Costa Rican attorney. I am focused in environmental, public and international law. Uh, as you can see, there's a couple of other names along. We work as a team, Saudio Law and also Almos, that is our technical uh, team. We are very focused and we always like to address this kind of topics with not only legally, but also scientific and technically approaches. So thank you very much for the opportunity and it's great to be here and deeply honored. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. In the room here, we have to my right, Georgina Beasley, CEO of Net Zero Lawyers Alliance. She's a Kiwi New Zealand qualified lawyer, I should say. To my left is Leticia Campos Mello. She is a Brazilian qualified lawyer. Uh, she is the Secretary General of the Brazilian Bar Association's Foreign Affairs Committee, which is the only committee that does not get dissolved each time the Brazilian our president changes, which is an important thing we will come back to later. Uh, to her left, we have Francis Patelon. He is special counsel at Our Tamimi and Company, based in Saudi. Now, staying, looking at the big screen, to my top right, we have Nina Pinney. She is one of England and Wales's leading barristers in environment and planning. She is absolutely brilliant. Um, to her left, we have Matthew Ng, who is the founder of the Chancery Lane Project, but he, in his day job, is a general counsel of the Oxygen House Group. 
And last but certainly not least, we have Professor John Dernbach. He is the Director of the Environmental Law and Sustainability Centre at Widening University, and he's been recently made um, Emeritus Professor at Widener. I welcome my friends here today, and I think let's just jump straight into it. We have not got a lot of time, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So. The first question we have, and I think John will be the first one to lead on it, why is climate conscious or climate competent lawyering necessary? What is it? And what are lawyers and the legal sectors doing about it? Over to you, John. Well, thank you, Lara. Can you all hear me clearly enough? Are we good? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So so when we talk about climate conscious lawyering, what we're talking about is lawyering with an understanding of the impacts that climate change uh, has on clients and also uh, in their clients that are in front of you and also the impacts that uh, the climate's, client's actions may have on climate change. When we talk about climate competent lawyering, we're talking about something similar, but we're putting an emphasis on the professional responsibility of lawyers to stay current uh, with science and in, 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 in technology. Um, the the um, basic purpose of legal education, of course, is to equip lawyers, to actually to equip non-lawyers to become lawyers and, and, and adequately and competently represent their clients. And the point we make when we talk about climate competent lawyering is that it's increasingly difficult for anyone who is practicing law uh, to be unaware of or uh, uh, the some of the basic science of climate change and and uh, also the, the ways in which um, the climate's a client's actions may be affected by present new and future laws um, what we're seeing in the United States is that climate change is is going way beyond environmental and energy law and is now um, uh, wending its way into tort law, contract law, uh, uh, insurance, business law, finance, and in and, and, and all of the rest. So again, I think we're at a point now, uh, perhaps if not already there, uh, where it's impossible to practice law without basic knowledge of the science of climate change and how it affects the legal risks and opportunities of one's clients. Thank you, John. Um, Francis, would you like to comment? Um, I think John is, is dead right. My, 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 my. It's, it's across the board now. But I think from, from my perspective, you've got all these huge kind of pillars of activity that are being developed, whether it's new reporting standards, whether it's guidance emanating from the Law Society of England and Wales, um, whether it's Tadawal in Saudi Arabia, the Stock Exchange issuing guidance in relation to ESG products, um, there's a huge amount going on, and as a practicing lawyer, I think that the, the kind of proliferation of initiatives is quite hard to manage. So what really excited me following the pandemic um, was to find out about the Chancery Lane project, which somebody from Lawyers for Net Zero um, pointed out to me, and I was delighted to find that because I'm sat in Saudi Arabia um, during that period, and sorry, I'm, can you hear me okay? Uh, Okay, okay. Let's hope there's no pandemic. Um, I think the Chancery Lane project is probably the best thing that came out of the pandemic. It was an opportunity, I think, for lawyers to stop what they were doing, in essence, and actually sit down and start thinking about how you draft around the Paris climate um, goals, 1.5, net zero, and so on. And I think it was done in such a highly collaborative way and very, very accessible it's it's made you know it's given lawyers some agency in terms of grappling with the kind of issues that, that, that john was articulating there because there's maybe 170 180 clauses on the website now and i know that, that matthew um is going to talk a bit about um how the chantry lane came into um inception but from my perspective as a lawyer who practices in saudi arabia what we've done with that we've taken our ball and run with it we've just translated the glossary 
from the Chancery Lane project, which is the kind of building block. It's what all the clauses run off. And we're also um, in the process of translating um, and transposing some of the kind of building block elements within the Chancery Lane website. Um, so there's a lot to do. Um, we're engaging with that. A team here in the UAE from our, our office here are about to embark on a transposition exercise um, in the uh, built environment space. There's quite a lot of built environment clauses on there. So I think I hear what John is saying. Um, things like the Chancery Lane project really put some meat on the bone of, of what we're talking about in terms of climate conscious lawyering. And I'll probably hand back to you now, Laura, if that's okay. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, going to the founder of the Chancery Lane project, Matt, could you give us a bit of an insight into the, I guess, the impetus for the Chancery Lane project, where you were a few years ago, where you are now, and where you are going? Yeah, th thanks, Lauren, and thanks for having me, and sorry not to be there in person. Um, the Chancery Lane project came out of London Climate Action Week in 2019. And um, I, I, I got frustrated that there was lots of talking uh, and not enough doing around climate change. And so I started thinking about what could we do to use our non-contentious skills that we've spent years and years um, honing and improving um, be that drafting, be that negotiating, and, and how can we apply those to make a difference? And so what we set about doing is, is drafting the contracts that are going to rewire the economy um, because lawyers interact and interface into every area of the economy and virtually every part of the economy is driven by contracts. And therein lies our agency uh, as lawyers when we get involved in the drafting to present a draft to our clients that is aligned with a better future. So for me, it was about the magic of contracts being this delivery system for decarbonisation that's both local and global, um, but also instant and lasting. And that's what's perhaps um, uh, magic about it is that we don't have to wait for the courts to opine. We don't have to wait for governments to pass legislation. We can take that impact today. And so uh, what I was what I was to say to people is that um, climate competent lawyering is not about being an activist. It's about being an activator. And what's the one thing we can all activate is the drafting in contracts. Thank you, Matt. Now, it's a very good point that Matt says, we need to do more of the doing and less of the chatting. We need to utilize our pens and our keyboards to put into practice and embed that which we know already at an international law and at a domestic law level, particularly to affect the just transition. Now, moving to um, I might uh, see if we can pick up with Nina. Now, as a barrister in a common law country, different roles and responsibilities to a solicitor, but on this point of competency, we're often tempted to say what the law should be and our role as lawyers is to tell it what it is, but forecast for the future. What is your thoughts on this, picking up on what Matt's talked about? How do we do it in practice? Yeah, and you're, you're right to distinguish the uh, regulatory obligations as distinct um, applying to barristers as opposed to solicitors. Um, one thing, for example, as a barrister we cannot do is uh, pick and choose our clients. So we're under what's known as the cab rank rule colloquially, and that means if we are um, uh, available if we have the capacity in our diary and competent in terms of our experience to assist a client and they're able to pay our fee, then we are mandated to assist them. So we're not in a position such as a solicitor's firm who is able to um, select the clients that they uh, assist with their legal knowledge. But in both cases, it's very important to, I think, be clear on the role of lawyers because I think we risk turning off um, quite a lot of the sector if uh, and also 
Um, the regulators uh, who are looking very, very um, acutely at this issue, my regulator, the Bar Standards Board, through the Bar Council is looking at guidance on this. We've already, as Matthew alluded to, uh, seen the guidance from the Law Society of England and Wales, which is truly world leading. And um, I'm not sure if Alistair is in the room or watching online, but deserves uh, commendation for his hard work there. Um, and other jurisdictions around the world are also looking at regulating lawyers in this space about how we need to be conscious of climate change and also to ensure that the level of service we provide to clients uh, is at the high standard, which they deservedly expect. So we have to understand climate change because it is inevitably um, the context, factually the context in which we are advising our clients, particularly me who works in the, the built environment sector uh, predominantly. It's it's a fact of life and every client is acutely conscious of it, especially my infrastructure clients who are looking down the line at um, not only a legal framework which incorporates net zero, but frankly a, a factual environmental framework which includes more severe impacts of climate change in a very unstable climate. So clients are aware of it and they want lawyers to be able to advise uh, accordingly, um, not only in the legal framework space, but also in the factual space. But as you said, Laura, we are not um, able to tell them what the law should be. That's not what they pay us for. Um, you'd have to go to your politicians for that. Just one thing to pick up on um, that John mentioned, and sorry, I'm just um, wrenching this in. He alluded to the fact that climate is affecting all areas of law. I cannot do better than to direct you to the excellent Climate Law Atlas produced by our uh, co-sponsoring university, the University of Cambridge, specifically Hughes Hall. So if you Google Hughes Hall Climate Atlas, there's a menu that shows all areas of law and how climate interweaves in that. So if you're having a, a, a query as to whether, for example, as an employment lawyer, climate affects your area of law, I can assure you it does. And the answer to that is found at Hughes Hall um, on the Climate Law Atlas. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Nina. And I can tell you there is a Cambridge professor in this room who got very excited at the mention of Hughes Hall. So thank you. Um, just picking up on what you were talking about, uh, for those in the room who are not aware, in April of this year, the Law Society of England and Wales published a guidance for its solicitors on the impacts of climate change. Now, we don't have someone flying that flag directly, so I will just quickly give you an overview. It made a number of points plainly clear for the legal sector, one of which is law firms as business enterprises are capable of greenwashing and that lawyers themselves should be aware of this. And I say should, uh, lawyers should understand their clients' uh, supply chains, value chains, their emissions change, and lawyers should advise in a way that forecasts best available science. And this applies to all lawyers. If you're a conveyancing lawyer giving advice on a property with a loan that that lasts for over 30 years and you're not advising on the state of that property in 30 years hence, you're gonna be in trouble. But those are the basics. So turning to Leticia quickly, who I do a lot of work with in this space, we've heard about England and Wales. What are other law societies and bar associations around the world doing in order to skill up their lawyers across the board to be more climate competent. What are we seeing? Sure, thank you um, and hello to everyone. Uh, so specifically about the Brazilian Bar Association, uh, we have 1.4 million lawyers that have to be registered to practice law. And um, it is, we are, we have constitutional prerogatives to defend the rule of law, democracy and human rights. Our Supreme Court was the one, uh, the first one in the world to actually say that the Paris Agreement has a status of human treaty. Um, some countries are still discussing uh, the right to ecologically balanced environment. We have this in our constitution since 88. Uh, we also have in our laws and specifically in our uh, companies law act, uh, the, fun the uh, companies, they have a social function. 
So that is also related with environmental issues, with work issues. And uh, what I want to point out here is that uh, OAB and the Brazilian Bar Association, we see the climate conscious lawyering uh, in a very specific view of also competency, of uh, uh, professional responsibility, of duty of care towards client. So I really liked what Matthew said before, because this was something that I also mentioned when I was a speaker at the Blue Zone, uh, in the Brazilian pavilion, which is not a matter anymore if you're an activist, you know, if you are for or against climate. You know, all lawyers, they have to understand that the minimum basis of, sorry, slow. <laughs> the minimum basis of climate law has to be understood, not because they are for or against climate, but because they have to give a good service for their clients. And there is no way in Brazil that a lawyer can assist a client now in many issues like real estate, like insurance law, like capital markets, uh, labor law, without having the minimum understanding of climate issues. Even to say, I can come with you until this point now we need to work with a specialist, but the minimum is necessary. And I want to point out and, and bring attention to the Chancery Lane project, because I think, you know, when I got in touch with it, it was a brilliant idea, because as I also say, all, all economical matters goes through lawyers. So, at some point, even if you are not a specialist, but you are working on something, you can Google, you can check something, and when you bring those clauses into negotiation in your own small world, you know, like with your own assistance of your client in your own country, you bring this, you bring this in. It is very important because then, if the company decides not to address those things, it is the responsibility of the management for this decision. So in this respect, I don't think I have a lot of time. So uh, we have, um, we have uh, on May 2000, this year, 2023, uh, because of the work we've been doing since COP26 uh, in coalition with International Bar Association, with American Bar Association, and with the Law Society of England Wales, uh, we have issued our own recommendation to our 1.4 million lawyers uh, of uh, the role of lawyers and of our own organization that has 27 chapters in each state of Brazil to address climate. So we have called lawyers to uh, participate actively in the legislative process. Uh, we have called lawyers to challenge laws that are negatively impacting uh, climate policies. We have also pointed out something that it's in our code of ethics, that it's our duty, our professional duty to appoint risks, not just lawyers in private sector, but also lawyers in public sector. Uh, and we have addressed uh, law firms because we are a very diverse country. We are not, you know, the, the developed countries with the big law firms. We also have the small law firms. We have addressed largest law firms with a certain revenue and also the medium and big companies with uh, legal departments to also address specific targets to the discarbonization. So that's what we are doing. Amazing, thank you. And just before we go to Georgie, just quickly in the room for you all to understand the uh, pace at which this is moving. In 2019, the American Bar Association issued their Climate Change Resolution 111, which John can speak to briefly. So that was only four years ago. In 2020, the International Bar Association issued our Climate Crisis Statement. It was a call to arm of sorts, encouraging, urging local bar associations around the world to issue resolutions and guidance specifically on climate. It was a piece of paper Leticia could wave in her national meetings to say, 
this is something that we all need to be doing. Then in 2021, we had the Law Council of Australia issuing a climate change policy statement, the American Bar Association issuing another resolution, the Japan Federation of Bar Associations issuing a declaration to aim for a sustainable society averting the climate crisis. The Canadian Bar Association tried unsuccessfully to issue a similar resolution. They all then spoke to each other, and this is not an exhaustive list. In 2022, the Quebec Bar Association did something similar, so did Northern Ireland. In 2023, the Council of Bars in Europe did something similar. Brazil did something similar. Scotland, only last week, issued something similar. And I can tell you that that happened in part through collaboration, friendship, trust between lawyers. And that's partly why we are here today, to build that. Now, moving over to Georgie, and if you have any questions, please contact any of us about it. Georgie, what areas of law are affected by climate? All. <laughs> and how are law firms responding to this need? How do you get partners to participate? And how do you help bring that change? Thanks, Lara. And just before I start, thank you for talking us through that wave of momentum, because I think, you know, there's a lot of messaging throughout COPs, outside of COPs that can feel overwhelming. And I think we need to focus on the, it's too, not too late if we act now, and there's momentum of acting now. So thank you, Lara. Uh, also, before I get to the question, uh, so I lead the Secretariat at the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance. You may not have heard of the NZLA, so in case you haven't, we are an alliance that, uh, that aims to mobilize commercial lawyers law firms and ultimately commercial law to accelerate the transition. So that leads me into what areas of law are relevant to transition, and as Lara said, all, very simply. Uh, part of the work we do at the NZLA is around capacity building of commercial lawyers so that they can uh, understand what net zero aligned legal services are. And so as part of this work, we did uh, work with Hughes Hall out at Cambridge University, as Nina has noted, on the Climate Atlas that starts to map out different practice areas and looks at how climate change is impacting you as a lawyer of that area and how you might have an impact on climate change on global decarbonisation pathways. Uh, this is a really exciting piece of work and I think really starts to get everyone thinking, regardless of their practice group, like I said, how is this relevant to me? This isn't an issue that sits just within an ESG committee at my firm. It's not just for the renewables teams. I am relevant. I can have, an, I can have impact with my expertise. Uh, we're looking to expand this work, so we're working with a team at NYU on a US edition uh, of the Climate Atlas, and then we plan to extend this work again and again. Uh, Lara, I've forgotten your follow-up, so you're going to need to remind me. No stress, mate. If I'm on a soul bite, no, I'm kidding. Um, so how do you help lawyers get through those blockers to the transition? How do you get the partners, the deal makers, the rain makers, the people bringing in the work to put this in scope? Because it's fine, I can speak from experience, as a more junior lawyer who tried to escalate this issue with varying levels of success. There are partners that are very keen for it and there are partners that don't wanna hear about it. How do you engage them have you seen a shift? What should cause us alarm? And, you know, how do we help? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Lara. Um, so we have had continued growth at the NZLA in terms of our membership. So we're up to 40 firms, and these include large international law firms, and we have global reach. There is uh, the momentum, like you were talking about, that lawyers are starting to understand that this is incredibly relevant for them. This is not a case of values over value. This is the, to understand climate is not 
just the right thing to do, it's actually the smart thing to do. And that, as I say, was quoted uh, yesterday at a panel that Hillary Clinton was moderating um, on getting more women in climate change. So, but I think relevant to this case of getting more lawyers understanding climate change. So I think this is working, people are listening. Of course there is pushback, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, yeah. Um, also, on your point on uh, blockers to transition, um, so this links back to our work with the Climate Atlas. So we have what we call an accelerator model at the NZLA, where we start to look at areas of the law that we would call burning platforms that are acting as uh, blockers to the transition. And we pull together the best members of, within the NZLA, the experts on these areas of law, we pull them together into cross membership groups and we start to, we get them to start to unpick these blockers to transition to create the enabling environment for transition to take place. Um, so for example, we've looked at antitrust laws and how uh, those laws or the perceived fears around those laws are blocking collaboration that's necessary to accelerate transition. And we start to look at how can you apply net zero aligned legal services to this area of the law? How do we break down that blocker? Thank you very much. Now, um, something we also talked about in our prep call is professional indemnity insurance, which I think needs more airtime. But Frederico, uh, What's your views on interdisciplinary approaches? Thank you, Lara. Well, actually, that was one of the main questions that I wanted to be addressed today. Evidently, as lawyers, we do need to have a lot of, I would say, a companionship, mentorship from the technical departments in order to understand how to address climate change, best solutions, best practices. I'm also very intrigued and, and, and try to focus a little bit of how we measure things. Environmental impact assessment is great for CETA things. But today, I think that we're needing more policies, more programs. Therefore, we need more robust strategic environmental assessments. I will be very grateful to hear the opinion, generally speaking, of all our experts of how we can try to introduce this interdisciplinary approach, perhaps not with those specific instruments, but how we can complement our professions with the technical expertise that is so needed in these days in order to understand climate change. The clock is ticking and the language is a little bit complex. We need to simplify. I was just gonna comment um, in respect to OAB, um, I, uh, which is the Brazilian Bar Association. Uh, I have this, um, idea of that our uh, bar association is also the one that has an exam that allows lawyers after law school to practice. So I think it's very important that we also work together with academy, with the law schools, uh, that climate law, it's not something that should be seen as separate from any other subjects. So climate law should um, uh, be taught specifically inside of each of the other subjects. So we are preparing even better the next generation of lawyers. So that would be my, my idea for this point. And I just want to also make a comment in respect to uh, Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, because I want to give my testimony because I was someone who actually needed the help of Net Zero Lawyers Alliance. We had a great project that was from a Brazilian woman that was an entrepreneur in Brazil that has an amazing initiative in respect to land use. And she needed um, assistance of how to match her project with the policies in Europe. And thanks to Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, we were able, they were able to match, you know, uh, this woman with this amazing project with a law firm that could do the work pro bono. So I would uh, certainly, you know, uh, tell everyone who is here and is watching us, uh, and especially from law firms, uh, to join Net Zero Lawyers Alliance because it is a very important way of connecting with projects, not just in the pro bono side, but you know, connecting with this new uh, 
opportunity because climate for law firms is not just about pro bono it's also about you know being prepared for opportunities in the energy side so it is also you know a way of commercially you know continue the operation of law firms so thank you I think I'll just echo that because as an in-house lawyer certainly the work we do is not in silos like it might be at a, in a law firm so that that cross awareness of the issues is is really important to us because when we have as a as an organization set a net zero target it almost requires a complete rewiring of the way we contract our business because in effect, our net zero target is like a service level agreement with the world, and we have to cascade that through every relationship. And so that cross fertilization of sustainability and law and climate is so important to understand where you need to bring in the experts, where we need to have lawyers that understand that intersection and the grayness within it, because there's not a lot of, there's a lot of black and white and a lot of judgment calls that need to be made during negotiations. Can I, can I just add a couple of comments to that? Can you hear me now? Good. Um, I, I think given the criticality of, of the predicament we face in the climate, what frustrates me sometimes at events like this is the focus on the young people and the students and the next generation and so on and so forth. Actually, it's probably people of my vintage who need to be getting their acts together and dealing with this crisis rather than cascading it down into future generations. So I'd make that plea to people out there. I wasn't expecting that. Um, the, the other thing that I would say, just building on, on work with Chancery Lane, is within that generation, you've got a big cohort of people who are let's say climate skeptic, they're very, very busy, they're the doers, they're the kind of deal makers within law firms. And this isn't something that's actually on their agenda. But one of the things I think that Chancery Lane does, because it's actually, with the greatest respect, Matt, it's quite dull. <laughs> you know, it's, it's reassuringly dull, it's heavy drafting. Um, it actually gives those skeptical people something that they can bite on. You're not just talking about Greta Thunberg or polar bears or what have you you're actually showing them some drafting that they can action, and it makes them relevant um, to their clients. So I think I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic, pragmatic about next year, because we've got these kind of big pillars hoving into position. There's lots and lots of law society guidance being promoted. There's lots of initiatives coming from, certainly in Saudi Arabia, um, some of the big giga projects are gonna have to kind of embrace um, all of this. And you've got things like um, you know, Chancery Lane project and this atlas, which I, I hadn't come across um, before. So it's a learning for me on 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 um, on this panel. So I think we need to focus on that group of lawyers who are kind of in their thirties, aspirant partners, and it needs to be embedded in their performance and remuneration goals that they start thinking about this stuff. It's not good enough to keep pushing it down onto the next generation. And my my sermon is over on that point. So. And can I just say thank you for that? Because as someone who's just turned 30, you know, I don't know if I'm still allowed to be in the young lawyer category, but it, if I can say this, pisses me off that the burden is on me when I'm not even invited to the boardroom. Like what power do we have collectively and how do we best use it? And you have so much more power than me in some respects. I would love to see a world where every law association and legal regulator made CPD compulsory each year to keep your legal license on this stuff. That would be practical goals. You know, that's the stretch stuff, um, you know, and we're working on it. Now, just to time keep, we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, I know my friend John will have some comments, so I'm going to ask him to give his views, my dear friend, and then we are, I'm just going to prepare you all after John I'd like you to all go around and in 25 words or less give me your one wish for this next six months and then we're going to open the floor for questions John so a lot of the conversation that we're having today is about um, 
what bar associations have been doing, beginning to play a leadership role um, among uh, bar associations and law societies on climate change. As Laura pointed out, and, and you've heard from some of the other panelists, there are resolutions from the American Bar Association, the Brazilian Bar Association, the International Bar Association, the Law Society of England and Wales. If you're in a position, um, wherever you are, to have your law society, your bar association, um, adopt a resolution encouraging lawyers to take into account the risks and opportunities of climate change, to learn more about the science and to engage with their um, elected officials, um, that would be a really good thing. And those of us um, that have, who've been working on this and who've been talking about it at the past, two cops uh, would love to have would love to be able to 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 work with you. Um, to the point about older lawyers and even younger lawyers getting engaged on climate and sustainability. Um, there are a boatload of resources I might direct you to, but there's a short book that um, uh, two colleagues and I published last year for the American Bar Association that shows um, how lawyers at any stage in their career can begin to get engaged in this. Um, I've been sharing a list of resources with the, 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 the hosts here, and that's one of them. The book is called um, Sustainability Essentials, a Leadership Guide for Lawyers, and it's, it's short, compact, and wherever you are, at whatever stage of your career you're at, and hopefully if you're a senior person, you look at this if you think it might be helpful, and I think it would be, um, to get started on, on, on integrating this in, into climate change, or excuse me, into your practice. Final point, um, lawyers need to uh, um, engage much more deeply on the leadership side of this. It's one thing to do this in your law practice. It's another thing to do the kind of thing that Matthew did, sort of stepping up and saying, well, gee, you know, we need to, um, and I'm just using him as an example because everybody on this panel, I think, could be used as an example, but say, well, look, what, what can I do? Well, we can get these clauses drafted. And I think it's more and more of us need to engage more and more deeply on uh, sort of getting involved and in motivating other people the, 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 the thought it would, the, that I share when I work with the American Bar Association is what would happen in the U.S. and around the world, in particular, if the U.S., the, the, the country's 1.3 million lawyers, or at least a larger fraction of them, did more in their practice and in their communities on climate change. It's intended to be a provocative idea because I think the role of lawyers here is, is understated and underappreciated. Um, and, and we can make a bigger difference than I think we have. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it. And uh, I was waving your book around in the room. I keep it in my bag at all times, um, genuinely. Um, so it's there if you want to take a photo of it, you want to know what it looks like, please get it. Um, just quickly, what's your wish? In a perfect world, you could have one thing for this space. And I say quick, I will steal the mic from you, 25 words or less. I would like for lawyers in the region where we all work to actually at the start of any transaction, raise the climate issue and say, well, what are we doing? You know, are, are we going to look at TCLP? How are we going to play that? And actually, if, if, if you just get blank faces, then educate them. Because I think it needs to get traction and the solution to this problem is going to have to involve the people in this region. I think that the, the people elsewhere appear to be better educated than that. So I'd make a plea to lawyers here. And also, if anybody wants to get involved in any trans lane um, transpositions into local law, I'm more than happy to, to collaborate. That's in the spirit of the, the whole program. So those are my two things, my two tips. OK, um, you gave me the microphone. I'm not going to say <laughs> in respect to specifically about lawyers. I'm going to talk about COP. So, yes, yeah, so I would, I would hope that the rich countries would actually write the checks for the least developed and developing countries. Yep, I think we all need to get over ourselves a bit on that. Georgie. Okay, this is lawyer specific. So I would wish for all lawyers to understand that they're a bit of an untapped lever in transition to build their own capacity, to take on that pro bono, and to understand how to align their legal services with net zero. Conveniently, those are parts of the commitment of the NZLA, so I encourage you to join. 
All right, we're going to go. Matt, John, Nina, Federico. My wish is that everybody starts using the clauses um, because it's like the Matrix. Once you do, you've taken the blue pill and there's no going back. And because I think we rely so much on precedence as lawyers that if we change the precedent, we will literally change the world. I, um, I would like more lawyers to be engaged more deeply on all of this. Um, in their practice, in their pro bono activities, in their communities. Um, and on some really deep level, um, on the climate issue generally, I'd like to see the tide begin to change um, um, in my lifetime. All right, I've got three points as lawyers tend to do. Um, collaboration, incentives and uh, recognition. So collaboration, more collaboration, sharing best practice in quickly de developing jurisdiction specific knowledge. And that collaboration to um, echo Frederico's excellent point includes scientists, we need them to help us with this. And um, incentives, carrots. So I like um, the point made earlier about tying the climate knowledge and um, uh, advice to remuneration, um, promotion and opportunities, and uh, leading on from that recognition that this is a significant opportunity. It's a significant uh, issue, but it's also presenting significant opportunities. Those are being mapped now. So the IEA's excellent um, annual report now recognizes there are more jobs in the green economy than the oil and gas sector now. Um, and that's only going to increase. And also the Climate Change Committee here in the UK has um, published research showing that the net zero uh, economy is better and bigger overall than the status quo, continuing with oil and gas as the um, uh, foundation um, of the economic system. So um, those are my three points and it's more than 25 words. Sorry, Lara. Vamos, Federico. Okay, well, since we're close to holiday season, I have two wishes. First of all, I will hope to have a lot of clauses in Spanish adapted to our, you know, legal system that is a little bit different. I will look forward for that. I think that it was very needed. And the other one is hopefully to have the Costa Rican Bar Association open up a specific course in order to be, you know, capable to have more knowledge. Those will be my two wishes for this six months. Gracias. As my friend Lusso. Layla said earlier, um, we need to stand united as a profession around the world, respecting space and place. As an English speaker, I don't want to be the vast majority in the room. So if you're sitting here thinking, that's great, but what about my jurisdiction? Come and talk to us. Um, the just transition is important. Lawyers have a role to play in their domestic setting. We've got to get the foundation right. That means incorporating Indigenous technical knowledge as well as experts for all the vast things we need to change. And I say that particularly as an Australian uh, whose Indigenous people are not even in the constitution. That's a legal problem that needs legal solutions. So with that, and before we do our final closing, any questions quickly? Fab. Okay, okay, three, okay. Permission to go five minutes over time. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, could you please just introduce yourself, uh, your affiliation and short question? Thank you. The simple answer is not enough. Laura, not... Laura, I mean, I don't, I don't, 
those of us who are remote, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I, I think may not have heard her at all or him. Okay, let me repeat quickly. Uh, in summary, um, universities, universities and law students, how are they benefiting from this collaboration with law associations when it comes to educating young lawyers? And is it happening at scale or much at all? I, I briefly said no, not enough. But John, you might be able to comment given your I, I, I agree, not enough, um, not, not nearly enough. The collaboration is very recent. The collaboration began in Glasgow two years ago, um, and we've got a long way to go. There's some very interesting work being done in Australia, New Zealand, uh, in particular, on integrating climate change into the law school curriculum. I'll just stop there. Uh, question back Okay, so in sum, for those online, how do our existing professional duties, how can they be used to further the transition and in particular environmental uh, protection? And that's from a, a legal colleague in Ethiopia. Anyone take a bite of the cherry? There's an art, well, I'm just gonna jump in if, if, if the, the, the um... A starting point here, I think, is recognizing in every jurisdiction precisely how climate change um, connects up uh, with with the uh, professional responsibilities that lawyers have. I think that's just a basic point that's not often recognized. Um, and and uh, we've been I've been doing sort of legal scholarship on that with a couple of people in the United States and. On some point, on some level, the point is obvious, but on another level, it's not. And I think if there were greater, if there was greater recognition of the connection between climate change and our professional responsibilities, and I would add all the, the environmental issues that the questioner asked about, I think um, that would that would help accelerate the transition.
do you know, I think the best way to deal with that is let's take it offline, come and get our carts, and we need to have a proper call about that. That's not something we can answer. I want to do it justice, and I'm sure that the people behind me and online want to do that justice as well. Thank you. Marcus. Sounds like your wish, mate. <laughs> That's, uh, for those behind me, how do we incorporate reporting on integrating climate competency and measuring it? Yeah, and it, that, that's the, uh, that's the um, utopia for me is to have this kind of visible database where we can see what people have committed to on the ground in particular contracts. But we have confidentiality we have listing rules so it, it's very complex but I've put out a white paper about a um, calling for a climate contract database which will make the transition more visible uh, on a ground contract level because every law firm likes to talk about oh we've helped this client raise this much money for this transaction but we don't talk about what the net zero targets were within that so I think the opportunity is there and I think again what I would echo from other, other participants is that this is an opportunity. There is an opportunity to gather that data and that data will be incredibly powerful. I agree absolutely with what Matt has just said about the, the data in, in effect on advised emissions. Um, in terms of the business of law, there's a really good organization called the Legal Sustainability Alliance, which we're members of. I think we're the only law firm headquartered in the region who's actually a member of that. And that organization gives you some fantastic toolkits in terms of how you can record your actual um, I suppose scope three emissions in the business of doing it. But then I think the bigger issue is is um, what your advised um, emissions might be like. That's a subject for future um, law discussions. Thank you. And um, I've told we've now we're being cut off. I just want to say thank you to Middlesex University for having us here um, in Dubai. I want to say thank you to the Climate Law and Governance Initiative for starting this 15 years ago. To Marie Claire, to Marcus, Antoinette, Maeve, Thalsa, Tejas, to all the people that put this on. It takes so much work and it's a flash in the pan when we're actually here. So if I can have my wish it's to not leave this conversation in the room. I feel like we bookend cops too much and it's all the stuff we do in the middle that counts. So please make friends, take it with you, make it count and make law the big lever. Thank you. And thank you for the excellent sharing. Bye everyone. Thank you.